Every year we spend the weeks leading up to this season searching. We search for the perfect gift that will deliver the perfect reaction on Christmas morning. We search for the perfect recipe that will impress a guest of honor. We search for the perfect event to attend that will bring the perfect joy we remember as a child. God has already given us the perfect gift of help. Jesus is the perfect gift, and He is also the giver of every good gift. It was September 7th, 2011. Miles McDonald and his friend uh, set out to hike the West Ridge of Mount Stewart in Washington State. It was a perfect day. Cloudless sky, clear forecast ahead, and they had perfect climbing conditions, and they set out. And the climbing was quick, and they found a good route. But then, as they were approaching the summit at about 9,400 feet, uh, Miles went for a reach, And the grab that he took a hold of, the rock broke free in his hand, and he fell. Shredded the rope, and he tumbled another 65 feet down the mountainside. Coming to a halt on the steep side of the mountain with critical injuries. It was noon. He had lost his pack, he had no supplies, He was in critical condition, and he is all alone on the side of this mountain. He fractured his scapula, fractured five ribs, had a collapsed lung, a serious concussion, and an eight-inch avulsion in his lower leg, which means the skin had been completely tore off, and it was just bone. And there he lay, unable to move and unable to help himself. The worst part of the story is that his climbing partner was above him at the time of his fall. And because the rope was so badly damaged, he was unable to rappel down to rescue his friend, to help him. And even if he could have gotten there, there was no way he could have gotten him off the mountain on that steep of a slope alone. He slid to him what supplies he had. And then his friend Matt was forced to go off the other side of the mountain in search of another route and in search of help, solo climbing on the way down. And there Miles lay, waiting for help. The people of God are stuck. They've been waiting 400 years and God hasn't spoken Waiting even longer than that, before the 400 years of silence, the prophets had come and gone. The prophets had foretold that God would one day send a Messiah, Yeshua, the Deliverer. And year after year of waiting and hearing these words, and now for 400 years, nothing. Silence. Decade after decade, century after century, and God hasn't been moving. Where was God? Where was this Deliverer? Enter Jesus. Luke chapter 1. An angel shows up to Mary and announces that she would bear a son. God was sending Jesus, Yeshua, the deliverer, into the world. We looked at that story a few weeks ago, but now Luke comes back to Mary and records for us her response to this good news. The good news that God is sending help to his people. And the response is found in Luke chapter 1, and we call it the Magnificat. So grab your Bibles and turn there with me to Luke chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there may be one under the seat rack in front of you. Pull it up on whatever smart device you use. If you have neither, if you're worshiping with us from home, watch the screen and we'll put the scriptures up so that you can follow along. But Luke records for us now Mary's response. As Luke moves from scene to scene and character to character, the camera comes back and it picks up Mary. And it picks up her response to this good news of what God is doing for his people. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, 
And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her, Elizabeth, about three months and returned to her home. So over the last two weeks, we've been tracing the story here in Luke chapter 1. As you recall, first Mary is visited by the angel Gabriel. He announces to her that she will bear a child, a son. They shall call his name Jesus, and he will sit on the throne of his father David forever. From that point forward there, Mary goes and visits Elizabeth, a relative We covered Elizabeth's story last week. Luke records for us that an angel also visited her husband, Zachariah, and and announced to them that though aged as they were and barren as she was, they too would bear a son. It would be John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. They would have joy. Many people would rejoice as this herald of the king would, would go out before the king and announce the king's coming, the king's arriving. Seeing all of this, visiting with Elizabeth, Mary is able to see firsthand the work that God is doing in her life as this baby leaps for joy when she walks in. And all of this just gives more confidence to Mary that God is, in fact, on the move. He is, in fact, sending help. And with this confidence in her heart, Mary leaves rejoicing and singing says verse 46, 47, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices. This is where we get the term magnificat. The original text first translated into Latin, magnificat, magnifies. My soul magnifies the Lord. Mary's moved. She's worshiping. She's rejoicing in what God is doing in her. If you're with us last week as we reflected on Zechariah and Elizabeth, the, the angel told Zechariah in the temple that they would have joy over this child that would come, but many would rejoice. And so look at what Mary is doing now. She says, my spirit rejoices. She's fulfilling the very words spoken to Zechariah. All of scripture coming together now in these moments as Jesus is coming on the scene. But what's so striking to me about Mary's song is how grateful she is for what God is doing so magnifies. My spirit rejoices. Why, why is that so striking? Well, put yourself in Mary's shoes for a moment. And to do so, you need to be a young girl in a first century Jewish culture. See, here's what we know of first century Jewish culture. The duty of every Israelite was to marry as early as possible. They would then seek to arrange a marriage for their child shortly after they reached puberty. So Mary, by this point, now betrothed, is likely 14, maybe 15 years old. Marriages were arranged once uh, families had found uh, an appropriate family, an appropriate suitor. The, the, far- the families, the parents would talk and discuss the arrangements and discuss the fit. And then those children would be uh, committed to one another. And, and once they were committed and the families had agreed on the, the arrangement of this marriage, then they would enter a one-year betrothal period. That one-year betrothal period was a time for the bride's family to prepare, and her father in particular, to prepare for the loss of this daughter, because it wasn't just the loss of a child, it was the loss of a set of hands helping on his property. In an agricultural setting, in an agricultural culture, 
when, when everything that you produce and earn and make has to come from your hands, this is a loss for the family, which is why there was a dowry. The, the year betrothal would then give the groom's family time to save up for this dowry to pay this father for what he would lose for the rest of his life. And it's in this year then that this couple was committed, the families are preparing, but understand the kids haven't even been on a first date. This is akin to signing the wedding certificate without exchanging the vows. You've become legal in the eyes of the state but you haven't really gotten married yet. This is the betrothal period. And so now imagine for a 14, 15-year-old girl, legally committed, but hasn't even been on a date, having to tell your father that you're pregnant. Oh, and it's by the Holy Spirit? God did it? Imagine trying to convince your father of that news. Imagine all the more trying to convince the other family. Imagine trying to convince them that, that this is actually of the Lord, this thing that's never been seen. And imagine their response. The, the text would go on and tell us Joseph's response was to divorce her quietly. The fact he would even do that quietly shows his character because in this culture, if you're found to be guilty of adultery, the first thing the man would want to do would be exonerate himself. I didn't do it. And yet he chooses to divorce her quietly until the Lord intervenes. But all the more, the family's appropriate response according to Old Testament law would be to call for Mary to be killed. Because the punishment according to Old Testament law was to be stoned. This is what God has invited Mary into. This is the burden that God has invited Mary to embrace. That for Jesus to come into the world... He's chosen this young girl in order that she would bear this weight of having to tell her family and receive the shame, the perceived shame of her entire community in a culture where a young girl has no voice, no rights, no status. And Mary in this moment does what? She sings, my soul magnifies, my spirit rejoices. Your 14, 15 year old daughter have the maturity to do that? To rejoice in what God is doing in that way? When this is a tremendous weight to carry. And yet, Mary does not view it as a burden to bear, she views it as an honor and a privilege to be called to embrace this work. She goes on, not only that, she says in verse 48 and 49 that that he has looked on her, his humble, the humble estate of his servant, and that God has done great things for me, Mary says. Mary doesn't treat this as a burden. She says she is nothing, and yet God has done something great for her. I don't know, if I were in Mary's shoes, I don't know that I would say God has done something to me instead of celebrating that he's done something great for me. This is an echo of the gospel, by the way. We who deserve nothing have been given a great thing in Jesus Christ. We deserve nothing. God has looked on the humble estate of his people, and he has given us the greatness of his son, Jesus. I don't know if you're old enough to remember. I'm not, but I saw this on Google. Uh, there's this comic a long time ago called Dennis the Menace in these paper things that would show up and tell you the news. Uh, when I was younger, I would always grab the, the cartoons, you know, the, the comic strip section of the newspaper. And Dennis the Menace, right, was that, that kind of haphazard rapscallion of the neighborhood who's always causing, you know, a ruckus and his hair is always messy. And he was always making trouble for one character in, in particular, Mr. Wilson, 
And there's this one comic strip where, where Dennis the Menace and his friend Joey have been causing trouble and, and they visit with Mrs. Wilson and Mrs. Wilson gifts them all of these cookies and they're walking away from Mr. and Mrs. Wilson's home with these cookies and Joey looks at Dennis the Menace and he's like, wow, we haven't been nice enough to, to deserve these cookies. And Dennis turns to Joey and he says, we didn't get these cookies because we're nice. We got these cookies because Mrs. Wilson's nice. Dennis understood what Mary understands in the story. Mary doesn't receive this favor of God because Mary is nice. God shows his help and his mercy and his grace to Israel because God is nice. And Mary magnifies, Mary rejoices, Mary is able to look past the inconveniences of her life in this time and this place and see a larger story of what God is doing for all of his people for all time. And she sings, my God has filled my arms with great things. I can't help but wonder if we see this season in the same way as Mary. Do, do we look at this season and do we say, this is not what I deserve? I'm of humble estate and yet God has done something great for me. Do we look around in the Christmas season and see echoes of Jesus and do we sing a song that says, I do not deserve this? I do not deserve this Jesus and I do not deserve this season. Is that your song? It should be. We should. We should. But there's more. It's not just that God is doing something great for Mary. It's that God is doing something great for his people. And she reflects on it in vivid detail. And she paints a picture for us as she continues. Pick it up with me in verse 51. She paints this picture saying, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. The rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, to his offspring forever. Two times now Mary's reflected on God's hand moving, on behalf of those of humble estate. Verse 48, and again now, verse 52. It's a picture of the gospel, a picture of the help of God. That we who are nothing have been given a great thing. Those of lowly estate, he has helped. And that's exactly how Mary puts it in verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel. That, that word helped means to take up a matter or to take up on behalf of. So, so what God's doing, what Mary's reflecting on here is that God has chosen in this moment to take up a matter. God has chosen in this moment to take up on behalf of. She's rejoicing that God has taken up on behalf of his servant Israel, his people Israel it's a picture of Israel struggling under a great weight, and God has chosen to take up this burden on himself. The, the word has a sense of, of God not just coming alongside of, but rather God taking on to himself a weight and a burden that was ours. Again, it's the gospel in the Christmas story. The we of humble estate, God has looked upon, and he has chosen to take this matter upon himself. God has chosen to take this matter of our burden, of our sin, upon himself. God has not just offered us a hand. It's not as though when we sinned, we tripped and we fell. We pushed a little button, help, I can't get up. And it's not that God comes and extends a hand to us so that we can stand back up on our own feet. That is not the gospel the gospel is that we were crushed under a weight too great for us to bear. Even with help to get up, we cannot stand. God then sends us his help. He chooses to take up the matter and to bear the burden, to place it on Jesus so that Jesus would stand when we could not. It's echoes of the gospel in the Christmas story. 
Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to take up our sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. God chose to take up the matter on our behalf that we might be able to stand before him in righteousness. In Jesus, we're given the good gift of help, Mary says. It's help for God's people. Jesus is the living embodiment of help. He's the living embodiment of every good gift. You see, the the beauty of the help and how expansive it is as Mary reflects in this song She reflects that God will right every wrong. So she says he's scattering the proud in verse 51. She says he's bringing down the mighty from their thrones in verse 52. She reflects on the fact that God is going to provide for his people. So she says he's filling the hungry, verse 53. He's helping his servant, verse 54, remembering his mercy. And she reflects that he's going to fulfill his promise, not just the promise to Abraham, but the promise to all of his offspring forever also, verse 55. All of this just reminds us, God hasn't just done a good thing for Mary, a great thing for Mary. God has done a great thing for you and for me too. Every promise from Abraham onward, forever fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Jesus is not just our help from our past things. He is our present help and a help that goes on into the future. This is an ongoing into the future kind of help according to the verb tense here. The psalmist would go on to say that our God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. This is the help that God has sent to us, to his people. And Mary's song here echoes that help. And Mary's song echoes the the help and all of the songs from all of the scriptures before. From all of the Old Testament saints singing these songs. From all of the Old Testament prophets proclaiming and and making these promises to the people of God. You, You see the depth to which Mary is hidden scripture in her heart here. When you consider what she's drawing on, you hear it in her words. Consider just the words of Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, verse 8 to 13. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. For those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Do you hear the echoes of Isaiah 41 in Mary's song? She is intimately familiar, intimately acquainted with the promise of God, of what God said he would do. I will take up the matter, he promised. I will be your help problem is we don't think we need help, do we? In our day and age, we're almost insulted that someone would insinuate that we need help. And when the scriptures say that God made Eve as a helper for Adam, we're insulted, aren't we? Woman is more than a helper. Except that that's what God calls himself. So you've been given a title and a designation and a description of something that he says is true of himself. Hmm. Not such a little thing after all, is it? Because God chose to take up a matter. We, however, think we don't need help. I'm doing fine with my life. I can manage my things on my own. I'm bearing this weight just fine, thank you. No one thinks that they need help until they get cancer. 
And then we're praying the doctor will get that appointment scheduled as quickly as possible. Cut it out. No one thinks they need help until they lose their job. And the bills start rolling in. And you haven't been able to line up that other interview. And it's really out of your control. No one thinks they need help until they're misunderstood. And people assume things and there's nothing you can do to fix it because they just carry it onward. And you feel stuck and alone. And people talk about you. No one thinks they need help until they do. And our God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. For those moments when you don't even think you need help, and he knows. The moments that you have hidden all of those things in your life, hoping and praying that no one sees and no one knows, and yet our God knows, and so he sent to you, Jesus, to take up the matter, to take up the matter on your behalf. No one needs help until they can't get rid of the guilt and the shame. Until they're faking it to make it. Hoping that no one notices how much their life is imploding. And who can fix that? Who can fix your past? Who can erase that? But the one who holds all of time and space in his hands. And so God chose to take up the matter, to take up the matter of what you did and you hope no one ever knows, to take up the matter of what was done to you that you can't get away from. God sent help. Our God is an ever-present help and Mary is reflecting on the help that God has offered not just to her, not just to, to his people Israel, but to you and to me. God has offered us a help in Jesus. And in the midst of our crushing weight, Jesus came that he might remove that weight from our shoulders because our God is an ever-present help. Mary rightly sings rightly rejoices in what God is doing. And I wonder, is that our song in this season? Or do we just get so excited about all the other songs in this season? And excited and caught up in all the busyness of this season, have we stopped to reflect on the fact that our God is our ever-present help? And Jesus came, Jesus came to take up the matter. This week in our Advent reading guide, you were, uh, if you've been following along, you, you were asked to reflect on this, this theme of help and our God as our help. Reflecting on Mary's words, reflecting on what God is doing for his people. You were asked to consider these two questions and reflect on these two things. And in that Christmas box that you took or whatever it is that you're storing these things in, here are the two things. First, on a slip of paper, ask the question, where have you seen God be your helper this year? Where has God showed, where has God showed his, his might for you this year? Where has he helped this year? As a family, we sat around the table and reflected on that. Where did God show up when you didn't know if he would? When no one else was there for you? Write that on a slip of paper and put it in the box. You'll be instructed Christmas morning to pull that out. And before we open any other gifts, to reflect on how Jesus is the living embodiment of every good gift. And then secondly, you are asked, and I'll challenge you again, to reflect on where is it that you are asking God for help. And to write that as a prayer and to store that away, along with the Christmas stuff, so that next year when you pull it out, you would see where God has shown up. You would see where God has delivered his help to you. And you would be reminded that what Mary's saying is true. He is. He is our help. He is an ever-present help. Let me just ask, do, do you remember what it was like to really be in need of help? Do you remember what it was like when you, when you first heard that help and that rescue on the way? It was noon. And miles had fallen and then tumbled 65 feet and was laying at the side of the mountain. 
in critical condition, bleeding, head spinning and pounding, struggling to breathe, not just because of the altitude at almost 10,000 feet, but because he has a punctured lung. And there, all alone, his friend has no ability to reach him or help him, so his friend leaves him in the hopes of catching a cell phone signal, calling for help, in the hopes that someone will be able to do for Miles what he could not do. And there, Miles lay for an hour, two hours, four hours, six, eight hours hours. The sun is setting and it's starting to get cold and the wind is whipping and he's beginning to think that this is it. I will die on the mountain tonight until across the valley he hears the echoes of this drum beat, this pulsing of helicopter blades through the air. And he hears on the horizon, his rescue is coming. His rescue is coming. And he said, in that moment, everything in my body changed. Everything in my mind shifted because I knew help was on the way. It's amazing what you can handle when you know help is on the way. It's amazing what it does to a broken body and a broken soul when you know help has come. God loved you and loved the world so much, John says, that he gave up his one and only son to help, to take up the matter of your sin and mine, to bear the weight of what you could not bear and to come with a rescue that no one else could offer. He offers it to you and he offers it in Jesus. And in this season, we don't celebrate lights. We don't celebrate songs and traditions. We celebrate that our God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. Do you know that? With what you're bearing, with what you're feeling, with what you've done or what's been done to you, do you know? that he came to take up the matter. Would you let him, would you let him take up the matter of your sin? Would you pray with me? And would you just take a moment before God, acknowledge to him where you're at, He knows there's nothing that you're going to say that's going to shock him or offend him. If it's hurt, if it's anger, if it's frustration, if it's burden, give it to him. Talk to him. And more importantly, invite him. Invite him to be the bearer of your burden. Would you today be willing to place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? Father God, we confess corporately how much we get hung up in a season, how much we get hung up in traditions and fanfare and shopping and music and cooking and eating and how much we make this season just a holiday when in fact, Father, you have been using this season to point us to your great help. And so, Father, we confess we are in need of help. We are in need of you. We are in need of Jesus, our rescue. Father, forgive me of my sin. Father, would you wash me white as snow? Would you give me eyes to see rightly in this world what you are doing and to follow you? Would you be willing to pray that prayer today? Father, forgive me of my sin. Father, wash me white as snow. 
Father, change my life and teach me a new way to walk in this dark world. But Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus. And we rejoice in the truth that help has come. We sing along with Mary that our souls magnify the Lord. Our spirit rejoices with God because you are our savior. And so we worship you and we lift high the name of Jesus, placing our faith and our trust in him and him alone. And all God's people said, amen.